<laughs> okay, great. Yeah. So yeah, we move to the last speaker. Yeah, Chen Lei Guo. So Professor Yongfeng Lu will be the host. So Professor Yongfeng, yeah, are you ready to introduce? Yeah, okay, Professor Guo, yeah. please. Thank you, Alice, and I'm very really impressed by the talk uh, by uh, Renmin, and he's young and promising, and hopefully, you know, we can get a, another Nobel Prize uh, in the uh, laser areas. I think that's not a dream. Uh, next, I'd like to introduce uh, Professor Chen Lei Guo uh, from uh, University of Rochester, U.S. So um, I had a pleasure to know Chen Lei from uh, a long time ago. I still remember that uh, we first met in, uh, in Photonics West. That's uh, 2004 or 2003. That's uh, almost 18 years ago. That time, Chen Lei uh, was a very young and energetic um, uh, new faculty. Now he's becoming very uh, achieved and known in the field. Um, so Chen Lei has a lot of achievements. So in order to you know, give him more time, so I just uh, uh, skip some of the details. But he is in the um, Institute of Optics at the University of Rochester, which is a uh, you know, um, uh, probably one of the top ones, if not top one, uh, in U.S. and uh, also leading one in the, in the world in, in terms of optics. And um, uh, Chen Lei uh, uh, was also a funding member of, uh, funding director of the joint uh, laboratory between uh, U.S. and China at Chen uh, uh, for Optics and Mechanics and Physics. So Chen Lei has uh, many, um, achievements and uh, scientifically he uh, is a fellow of uh, American uh, Physical Society and uh, Optical Society of America. Both are a refreshing of, uh, of his uh, scientific achievements and also China has uh, done a lot of more applied research in the area of uh, uh, functionalization of uh, materials which has uh, attracted a tremendous amount of uh, attention uh, not in the scientific community, but also from general public. Um, you know, his work has been uh, featured by many public and media, like in newspapers and uh, very uh, major uh, TV uh, stations in the US, like I remember CNN and ABC uh, featured the journalist's work. Uh, and his um, um, work has also contributed to the, uh, I think globally, um, I think China has one program uh, project is to develop a new toilet in uh, uh, an Africa company. I forgot it is in, in uh, uh, which country is to uh, develop like a washless uh, toilet using his functionalization. So I think that his uh, contribution is a uh, multi-facets from science, from uh, application, and uh, also even you know in the uh, I think education area because his uh, work has inspired a, a generation of young people uh, who will, you know, uh, uh, it was their time to 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 science. Um, so today he is going to talk with us on a topic which is his uh, very, I think, uh, amazing work, uh, material functionalization with uh, femtosecond lasers. So Chen Lei, yeah, go ahead, please. Okay. Let me uh, share my screen. I hope um, um, okay. Um, well, first of all, um, uh, thanks to uh, Professor Lu for the very kind introduction. As he said. Um, Rungfeng and I have known each other for a long time, and I consider Rungfeng both as a as a friend as well as a mentor. And oftentimes, I think Rungfeng provide a, the kind of inspiration for um, many of us to look upon on, uh, in this uh, community. Um, so, um, so as Rungfeng mentioned, um, so today I'm going to discuss uh, this topic. Um, so I will discuss how, what the interaction will be between some ordinary materials, for example, metals and glass and with an extraordinary type of laser, the so-called femtosecond lasers. So from this cover image, we can see um, a laser beam comes in heat on the material surface. So uh, over the course of my talk, I'm going to discuss 
how the laser beam will alter the material surface and what kind of properties a, uh, uh, this uh, altered surface will acquire and what kind of applications this surface will have. And um, so an experimental tool for, uh, for my work is this so-called femtosecond laser. So just give you a sense, here are some uh, different femtosecond laser systems uh, in my lab. And they have uh, uh, slightly different features. And if you open a, a laser cover, you can see some very uh, colorful laser beams. So um, what exactly is a femtosecond laser? And basically uh, a femtosecond laser deliver uh, short, ultra short uh, uh, pulses lasting on the order of a femtosecond. So we can see from this slide, a femtosecond uh, is equals to uh, uh, equivalent to 10 to minus 15 second. We know to just give you a sense of how short uh, this uh, femtosecond pulse is, we know um, light travel very fast. Uh, indeed, within a second, uh, the light will travel across the, uh, around the earth for 7.5 times. Um, so in comparison, uh, over one femtosecond, the light beam will not be able to even travel uh, a hundredth of the width of a human hair. So, um, so in comparison, we can see a femtosecond pulse is extremely short time burst. And that gave us um, the other side of the, uh, you know, the properties, and which is we can squeeze uh, just a very moderate amount of energy uh, into a very short time burst. And then um, that moderate small amount of energy can give us uh, extraordinary high peak power. So in this case, um, so typically a femtosecond pulse will have um, a few millijoule of energy. So give you a sense, a millijoule is the kinetic energy of a drop of water falling from the ceiling to the floor. So think about if you're just packing um, you know, a couple of millijoule of energy, but you squeeze this uh, very small amount of energy uh, really in this uh, very short time burst and ended up you have a very high peak power. So, um, so essentially um, the, the peak power of a femtosecond um, uh, laser pulse will be equivalent to the wattage of the North American power grid. And not surprisingly, um, we, can, uh, we can certainly imagine, you know, if you use a femtosecond uh, pulse to uh, process the material surface, and you can uh, uh, induce some very dramatic change onto a, a surface. So here uh, is a comparison between a relatively long uh, laser pulse, a nanosecond pulse versus a, a femtosecond pulse, the, following the uh, laser ablation, okay? So we can see a femtosecond pulse uh, is a much cleaner um, material processing because the energy, um, so we only use a moderate amount of energy, um, but the peak power uh, give us the ability to uh, have more precision processing. Um, so um, indeed, you know, early, early in the days, people will be uh, very curious about how far you can push to use a femtosecond uh, laser pulse for a precision uh, micro machining. Um, so, and also uh, pushing towards uh, producing smaller structures and maybe uh, uh, below the, the optical wavelength. And these are, these are some earlier works and basically uh, looking at how uh, people use femtosecond laser poles and then trying to uh, produce very small structures down to the nano scales. And however, um, all this uh, um, basically I summarize in a few different technology. Most of them have to rely on some additional technologies. So I'll call this assisted laser uh, micro and nano machining. For example, they will need to use a mask, need to use some near field coupling, need to have uh, maybe a plasmonic or chemical etching. Um, so when I started um, work in this area, um, well, I you know, start having the lab at University of Rochester. Um, 
I was looking into if we were able to um, process uh, finer structures through direct laser material, laser pulse processing without utilizing uh, uh, you know, additional techniques. So this led us you know, uh, really push this effort. And so here are some earlier results um, back in 2006. You know, we can see uh, with the laser beam, direct laser beam processing, we can produce very small um, nanoparticles uh, down to the tens uh, nanometers. And so I have to say, you know, this, these uh, structures are produced by, it's now by laser carving um, because the laser beam, if this were indeed the size, uh, this structure were indeed the size of what, we, what you have seen on the screen, the laser beam will be the size of a skyscraper, okay? It will be huge. So this is, this is uh, basically within the laser beam and we will be able to uh, uh, produce all these uh, tiny structures. And then we're looking into uh, if we could, although these structures are somewhat random, but we were also uh, looking to if we could um, uh, produce some long range ordering uh, for, uh, for this uh, uh, surface structuring, okay? So, um, so here are some results, you know, we, we can see, um, so we can produce uh, uh, this different type of structures. And then, um, you know, although in a very small scale, they might be somewhat random, but in a larger scale, we can see some uh, periodic uh, orderings. And, and uh, because of this uh, direct processing, it really gave us a, uh, a very unique tool use femtosecond laser and to uh, um, produce a range of micro nanostructures. And in turn, these um, micro nanostructures and also give very unique properties of the material surface. So that's what I, um, you know, will call this a functionalized material surface. So here are a couple of technologies uh, developed in my lab. Now, the first a couple of technology was uh, we can see from here is uh, one is called the black metal and on the uh, top right corner and we can see a, sh a piece of shiny piece of metal uh, after the laser treatment we can uh, transfer it uh, to pitch black and therefore this uh, material will be a uh, highly absorptive uh, for light and then this main uh, main figure we can see here is uh, uh, again um, shiny metal and transfer into different colors so um, um, not only for a optical properties, we were also looking into how the, the laser can uh, alter the wetting properties of a material surface. So in this uh, short video, we can see a, uh, we were able to transform um, a surface, including metal and silicon. In this case, it's a silicon uh, to superhydrophilic. So superhydrophilic means the, uh, the, the surface really attract water. So we can see the demonstration. If you place the water at the bottom of the surface, the, the water actually will run uphill against the gravity. So um, later on, I'm going to, uh, throughout the rest of the talk, discuss some of the applications really enabled um, by these uh, properties. But here from this uh, uh, New York Times article right after our work uh, in producing the surface, and we were discussing about, this is uh, uh, the title for cooler chips, follow the grooves. And basically uh, um, uh, we were discussing for silicons, if we can uh, uh, produce this super weakening effects, we can uh, spread the liquid uh, across the surface very quickly. And therefore we will be, be able to uh, enable liquid cooling for, for, ex for example, microelectronics, silicon chips. Okay, so following that, we were also work on uh, the counterpart technology. So in this case, we can see uh, we were able to dis, uh, develop this uh, surface, which is a super water repellent. So the water will be rolling off from the surface, it will not be able to uh, stick on the surface. And so uh, with these uh, background technologies, so today, um, um, in this talk, I'm going to uh, mainly address a few, uh, touch upon a few different things, especially some of the recent developments uh, in my lab. 
and I'm going to discuss some fundamental studies looking at the dynamics of the surface structure formation, and then I'll discuss uh, how can we better control the laser surface structures um, uh, in a more controllable way. And then for the remaining of the talk, I'll discuss some of the applications. Okay. So, uh, so for dynamics, um, so obviously, uh, after we, we were able to uh, find all these different types of structures, one fundamental question we would like to ask is how, how these structures and were able to form and what, it, what are the dynamics of this uh, structural formation? Because if we understand better the mechanism, the dynamics, we can better understand how to uh, control um, the studies uh, in the future. So um, the femtosecond laser uh, material interaction actually is a, is a complex problem. So from this chart, and it's a, we discussed this in a review article a number of years ago, and it's involved, for example, heating up the electron, heating up the phonon, you know, we can have melting, ablation, and surface restructuring. Um, so, um, so for to really understand uh, how we were able to form all these structures, well, the most direct way would be if we were able to uh, take a movie and record this dynamics. And that will give us um, a really, uh, um, you know, profound insight about how this uh, microscopically the surface structure will form. And this is indeed the work we did a um, number of years, a uh, couple of years ago, and trying to uh, use optical imaging technique uh, to try to uh, film this process essentially. Okay, so although um, uh, it's easy to say, but uh, experimentally it's, a, it's a actually a very difficult experiments. And this involves, and we have to have a laser beam. And um, so we have to uh, split the laser beam and one arm uh, on the right hand side of this, uh, what we can see on this uh, uh, experimental setup, we call this pump beam. The pump beam will hit on the surface and induce all the surface the, uh, structure formation melting, you know, uh, um, have this uh, formed. And then we have another arm on the left side, we can see is passed through a very, very long path. And this path will eventually, also the beam will overlap with the same spot of the pump beam. So we can use this so-called probe beam to, uh, uh, to take a movie of this dynamics. And we already mentioned early on, the laser beam travel very fast. So in order for us to look at a longer time delay, and we have to delay the beam uh, to a very long distance. So indeed, you know, in, in order for us um, to look at the dynamics over tens and hundreds of nanoseconds, it's still really, really short, but we have to delay the beam over hundreds of meters. So basically the experimental setup wise, we have to uh, have the beam propagating uh, in a lab and uh, back and forth, back and forth. Um, this is what you see for, uh, for all these mirrors. So eventually um, we were able to, um, here are some structures. So, um, so what I'm going to do is I'll, I'll show, show everybody this next slide. So here are some structures as time evolved and we can see uh, how the st surface structure will develop. And from the very top at 300 picoseconds, 400 picoseconds, and then we can see we go into a few nanoseconds, and then we go into tens and to, hun to hundreds of nanoseconds. And then indeed, a surface structure will develop over this time scale. And we will also be able to uh, uh, really identify over a few hundred nanoseconds, the surface structure will settle and then eventually uh, give us the, the final um, uh, structural results we needed. And another interesting thing, if we're just looking at this, uh, uh, this imaging uh, graph, we can see really give us very unique perspective um, to understand this uh, 
very short time scale dynamic. If you're looking at the first view, view graph, uh, the um, images. So we noticed the structures actually are formed in first in the peripheral area and then and then moving towards the center. Um, so you know there's there's quite a bit of physics here. Um, I I don't think I'll uh, be able to get into the the detail of the physics. The reason for that is um, um, the peripheral area have a relative lower intensity and the nanostructures are start to form in the peripheral area and then the larger structure later on will form in the center areas. Um, so the bottom line is um, I just wanted to uh, um, to basically give you a idea about how this dynamic can be studied uh, for to help us to understand the physics. So uh, we certainly have um, worked on this problem and trying to understand a lot of uh, different uh, you know, conditions and regimes. And one interesting thing is we discovered um, based on our experimental evidence, um, the, the, the final solidification actually takes hundreds of nanoseconds, which is in uh, contrast with a lot of earlier uh, theoretical predictions and many theoretical prediction I listed at the bottom of this page predicts only take about a few uh, nanoseconds. So, uh, so this type of experimental results, once again, will give us some um, evidence for future studies. It's still a very complex problem that requires us um, for uh, uh, further understanding. So, um, so let me uh, uh, move on to the to the next topic about um, how can we actually uh, have a better control of the surface structures? And if so, how do we do this? Okay, so early on, I show some of the structures, they have a little bit random. And here is a, a interesting types of surface structures, so-called laser induced periodic surface structures. And um, this actually has been discovered a long time ago in the 60s. And we can see uh, with the laser beam, you are able to um, uh, develop some, um, some of these uh, periodic greeting structures. Um, but you know, earlier work, the structural quality uh, is not very good. So recently, in the last uh, uh, couple of years, um, our our lab and also um, with uh, with our um, our collaborative lab um, in uh, Siam China. So we work on this uh, this technology. So we can also split the beam into two, have a double pulse to irradiate the surface. So we can have the first beam sort of a prep the sample a little bit, and then the second beam comes in, and then trying to uh, increase the uniformity. So here is some results. Uh, we can see at a different delay between the two beam, at a certain delay, in this case, about eight picoseconds, 14 picoseconds, we can see uh, the ordering of the structure are significantly improved. Okay. So, um, so here are some you know, more um, uh, highly ordered surface structure we're able to produce. And well, in this work, is uh, some recent work. It was about uh, not only we can uh, we can use the technique uh, for ordinary materials, but we can also apply this uh, technique on some graphene. So in this case, uh, graphene oxide is only about over a hundred uh, nanometer thick graphene oxide. We're able to create this uh, very highly ordered periodic structures. Um, so then the next question is, um, if we can uh, produce more complex structures um, within the laser beam. So in this, in this graph, uh, we can see we can um, um, use some uh, polarization optics to manipulate the beam polarization. And then within the laser beam, we can have different uh, spot uh, precise and different polarizations because polarization is indeed important in determining um, these uh, periodic structures. And, and then we will be able to perhaps within the one laser beam, we can produce all these different st surface structures. Indeed, you know, 
Um, so in this, uh, uh, a couple of works, uh, also very recent works, and we can, uh, um, within um, this uh, small area, we're able to create uh, continuously rotating uh, periodic structures. And that periodic structure also gave us a very interesting optical effects. So on the right, we can see um, if you, your grating only order along one direction, obviously from different angle, you will see uh, interference pattern somewhere bright, somewhere dark. But if you have the orientation along all different directions, even we rotate the sample along different directions, they all appear uh, to be having the uniform colors. Okay, so, um, so here's the work. Um, we, we were trying to uh, um, use the technology to, to uh, develop two-dimensional surface structures. Okay, so here are some demonstrations on a, a, um, on a metal surface under different experimental conditions, we were able to produce all these different surface structures and including rectangular, triangular, you know, um, this uh, rhombus and spherical and, and also this wavy uh, sinusoidal uh, shapes. And therefore um, the, the laser technique essentially will give us hopefully will give us a tool and that um, one day, you know, really hope is can start to compete in or with this uh, uh, more conventional lithography technique. And the advantage of laser processing is, um, it's a very um, easy to do. You can do it in air, in different materials, you know, in contrast, um, electron E-beam lithography, uh, focus ion beam lithography, you have to do is in the eye, in a vacuum environment, you know, you can, um, you have a, a far more constrained experimental uh, condition. Also, it's very costly. So here, um, if we can continually push in this laser uh, processing direction, I hope um, we will be able to uh, um, develop some more better control in the surface structuring. So in this case, this last example I would like to show is, um, not only on metals, uh, earlier a few graphs, I was mostly discussing on metal surfaces. And here is a glass. We know glass is very important because all these uh, displays and smart devices. And um, the patterning of glass in this case, um, we know it's actually difficult to process glass because they're transparent, uh, will, doesn't absorb light uh, uh, very efficiently. And in this case, what we did was uh, we could we could coat the glass with a very thin metal film, and then after this, uh, so we can see from the upper left, and we coat this with a copper film uh, over 100 nanometer, and then we can use the laser to uh, process the material, and and then we can first break down the glass, uh, break break down the metal, and then this metal will assist further to uh, uh, etch in the glass. So we can see some very highly ordered structure will be able to form um, by us to use in this, uh, this technology. So, um, so some of the fundamental uh, mechanism for this, I already mentioned. Um, so you actually break down the metal first and then the breakdown metal will help with the glass processing. Okay, so uh, for the remaining of the talk, I'm going to focus on just give a, give everybody a, uh, a some flavor about different type of applications uh, our functionalized surface will be able to in enable. Okay. Um, you know, because of time limitation, I'll not be able to get into too much details, but hopefully uh, this this will give give you some flavors uh, about what can we do. Um, so uh, in this in this study, um, so this is the uh, um, relates to uh, our super hydrophobic surface. Okay, so um, people will be able to imagine super hydrophobic will help with uh, repel water, and and therefore um, so so here we can see it's not only repel water but also uh, we can make this repel other uh, type of liquid and including uh, um, this uh, uh, lower left corner, we can see including milk, 
coffee, you know, oil. Um, so, so they all beat, beats up on the surface. And the other interesting thing is uh, if, if uh, the surface repels water, it's also going to repel steam, uh, the, the, fog, the fog, and also repel icing as well. So here are some demonstrations. Uh, on the left, we show a surface, a hydrophobic surface will actually have anti-fogging effect. On the right-hand side, and we're also trying to uh, uh, form icing on the surface and ended up and the hydrophobic surface will be, uh, will be uh, uh, much harder for the ice to formation. And even you have some ice sort of stick to it and a, a very slight shake will get the ice out of the surface. Okay. Um, so in this, in this study, um, so what we did was we, we were trying to explore when you have a super hydrophobic surface, and um, so the liquid will not uh, attach to the surface, will not, um, therefore you can have the liquid uh, release much more efficiently. So in this demonstration, what we did was we actually uh, process a, a needle, um, the tip of the needle uh, to super hydrophobic, and therefore, uh, we can use the needle. And this actually was a, a, a problem uh, because the conventional needle, if you're trying to release a very small drop of water, and sometimes it can be hard because the water droplet will uh, attach, will clinch onto the, onto the needle tip. And, but in this case, if we uh, get rid of this, uh, this uh, attachment, uh, uh, you know, um, the effect, we can uh, use the needle to remove, uh, to transform much smaller uh, droplet. So give us a much better control of the liquid uh, transportation. Okay. So in this, in this work, um, we were also able to use our pattern surface. Um, actually for both hydrophilic and hydrophobic surface, we can make a pattern and some part hydrophilic, some part hydrophobic. And if we apply this uh, surface, um, we're able to uh, um, have a higher efficiency to collect the moisture from air. And then we can have the air condensation and eventually we're able to uh, harness uh, uh, water. Okay. So, so here's the work. Again, I wouldn't be able to uh, uh, get into uh, the detail of the work, um, but this is the, uh, we use a, a femtosecond laser as a tool to carve in some micro, micro channels and therefore we can uh, enable much better uh, lab, on, lab on the chip technology. So uh, especially um, if we're looking at the figure on the right and we can uh, build this uh, very tiny um, micro channels uh, all directly with the femtosecond laser. And, and also we can have the hydrophilic uh, effects to drive the liquid, self-drive the liquid, and then having the liquid um, starting from, the, from the either end of this trip, um, and then both moving towards the center and have some chemical reactions. Okay. So, um, the other interesting work is uh, we, were, we were interested in looking at if we were able to repel, have the surface repel water, what about other things? What about polymers? So in this work, uh, we develop this surface uh, that will be able to repel polymers, uh, especially underneath water. So we call this a super poly polymorphobic. Okay. So, uh, um, the application you can enable this is, um, so this is a one demonstration. Now we can have, first we can have the surface immerse into under water, and then we can have a polymer, uh, some liquid polymer and uh, uh, touch on the surface. In this case, it's PDMS. And then uh, the, the surface will repel the polymer. The polymer will not be able to get into the surface structures. So we can see indeed, there will be a, a gap underneath the polymer uh, droplet. And then 
And then afterwards, we can just evaporate the water and kill the polymer. And then we can have this uh, a tiny micro channels. So we can see from the two bottom images, these are the actual real image. We can form this uh, a very tiny channels um, through this technique. And, and that's really can enable us for some micro, micro uh, uh, you know, fluid dynamics devices. And these are some work uh, was also published uh, last year. So, um, so we will also be able to demonstrate some, uh, for example, antibacterial effects because if a surface uh, repels water, it will also be able to, uh, um, you know, uh, potentially uh, trying to uh, 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 inhibit bacteria uh, formation. In this case, because all the living living uh, uh, organs are made of a large amount of water. So in this case, we were uh, study different type of structures and then trying to, trying to understand which structure will give us the best antibacterial performance. So in this figure, um, we actually, uh, uh, all this uh, green box, those are uh, after we treat the surface and then we try to grow um, with some collaboration, trying to grow bacteria onto the surface. And then um, the, the green circle, this black color are actually bacteria formation. And we can see an untreated surface on the, uh, on the very upper left, have a lot of black color bacteria formation. But if a surface get treated, oops, uh, for this uh, a C, we can see uh, a very small amount of bacteria will be able to, uh, E. coli will be able to develop. And, and indeed, um, with the femtosecond laser technology, we will be able to suppress the bacteria growth by 99%. Okay, um, that's the, well, this is the, another um, um, somewhat interesting work. We, we were, uh, um, you know, a fun work we were trying to develop in the lab because we have this uh, super hydrophobic surfaces. And um, one thing is, uh, although you can have the surface super hydrophobic, but you can still push it down if you push it hard enough into the water. And once the hydrophobic surface uh, submerged into water, you will not be able to come back and eventually it might uh, relent to the water pressure. However, if we put two surfaces, hydrophobic surface facing each other, and then we can trap it, uh, a bubble air between the two surfaces. And with this structure, we can have the surface and perpetually, almost perpetually floating on the, on the, um, on the water surface will not be able to sink. Even you, you force this, the structure, this assembly into the water, it will, it will bounce back, okay? So uh, to just illustrate these effects, let me just show uh, a video. And what is uh, interesting is, um, I just wanted to point it out, in this, for this surface structure, if you puncture the surface structure, having a hole onto it, you'll still be able to uh, have the surface continue floating. So let me sh show a video and we can see some of, the, some of these effects. So the one on the right is this metallic structure. The one on the left is basically um, regular uh, comparison structure. So, uh, so indeed, um, once we have this uh, surface structure form, uh, because hydrophobic effect trap the air, and it will always have in our surface uh, this assembly stay floating. So let me. Uh, um, let me go to the. So um, let me. So the the next 
um, um, for the remaining of the time, I would just like to demonstrate some of the, the most recent work we did was trying to uh, have some energy applications. And this is one application uh, we're trying to use uh, for so-called thermoelectric uh, generators. So what thermoelectric generator is, uh, you have a hot, uh, if you take a look at the, the image on the, on the left, we have a hot side and we have a cold side. If you have a hot, a pair of um, these plates, and then um, the temperature gradients will, will, um, will generate electricity from some semiconductor uh, material sandwich between these two hot and cold plates. So the efficiency of the thermal electric generator really depends on the temperature gradients. The hotter the plate, the colder the hotter the hot side, the colder the cold side, and will be better to have for us to have a better um, uh, efficiency in the thermoelectric generator. So basically, uh, our work was uh, how can we uh, have even uh, uh, more efficient uh, thermal absorption on the hot side and better uh, thermal radiation on the cold side. Okay. So this is one work uh, we did was um, to try to increase the efficiency of uh, light absorption. So if we use the a TEG, the thermoelectric generator underneath the sun to absorb the sunlight. So, um, and therefore the better absorption, uh, the better uh, we'll be able to uh, heat up the hot side. So from this graph on the left, we can see the solar spectrum actually is uh, only have a strong radiation up until about 2.5 microns. And then afterwards, um, there will be very little solar radiation. Um, I mentioned we have a black metal technology, but the black metal technology absorb all, all different color lights over a very broad bandwidth, which is good for absorbing solar energy. But on the other hand, it's also emits very strongly in the IR. Potentially, it can leak out a lot of heat. So that, that's what we do not want, okay? So, uh, so this green color is the black body radiation at about 400 degrees C. And we can see uh, the heat will radiate uh, in this uh, longer IR wavelength. So what we want is if we can um, modify the, the absorption, only absorb the solar spectrum, but minimize the IR absorption and emission, that would be an ideal. Uh, solar absorber. So this work, basically, we were trying to control the surface structure and then trying to achieve these properties. Okay, so eventually we were able to uh, demonstrate uh, some surface structures um, on this, uh, the, the upper left. We can see if we have this periodic groove, have very tiny, uh, small nanostructure on, on top of this, eventually we will have a very good uh, spectral response, perfectly, almost perfectly matched in the solar spectrum. Uh, on the other hand, if you have a larger structure, this will be a more um, a broadband absorber. Um, so we were able to uh, use the, our technique to control, us, control the solar uh, spectrum. So in this demonstration, we integrate our surface onto the hot side and then we can uh, uh, demonstrate this uh, underneath a, a, a solar simulator. We demonstrate over 130% efficiency increase. Okay. So on the other hand, as I mentioned, you can also dissipate the heat more efficiently on the, on the cold side. So here is another work. Uh, we also, we, we just uh, uh, did very recently, we, were, we will be able to uh, uh, process the material and surface, create a structure and make the heat that's uh, dissipation more efficiently so we can cool down the cold side through both uh, convective cooling and also radiative cooling. Because um, um, two things, if you have a larger surface structure and also if it's uh, uh, the surface turning into black and they will radiate more strongly. So here um, in the bottom row, these are the some surface structure we produced. And this type of surface structure will uh, indeed allow us to uh, demonstrate much stronger 
convective cooling and also radiative cooling. So if we integrate um, this uh, surface onto the cold side, and we actually demonstrate about 280% increase uh, on, the, on the solar uh, TEG um, efficiency. Uh, in a separate work, we actually also use uh, a different technique rather than the laser technique, use uh, uh, um, some aluminum uh, oxide uh, AO technique making the finer structures. And this is actually a separate work published in uh, also na uh, nano energy. And in this case, uh, we were also able to uh, dissipate the heat more efficiently on the cold side. Okay, so this has come to uh, more or less the last, last piece of a demonstration I would like to discuss because we have this uh, super hydrophobic uh, surface and we can, uh, we can use uh, both the function of absorb the sunlight as well as the super weakening effects. One thing is um, um, people have been using different technology to for solar water sanitation. So basic idea is that if the sunlight heat up the water and then evaporate the water, and then you can collect the, the, the water steam, and then this will purify the water and leave the dirt behind. So uh, conventionally, um, is, uh, if you heat up the, 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 the water into a large volume, only the very top layer get evaporated. So it's not very efficient. And more recently, people have been looking into what if we can just heat up the top layer, the so-called interfacial uh, evaporation. Um, but the current technology, existing technology, um, the material wise, mostly they have some uh, spongy foam type of material. They have to float uh, on top of the surface. And also they mostly have some closed pores. Once the, the pores get clogged, actually very easily, the material will not be able to get used anymore. So in this work, we will demonstrate if we were able to uh, uh, pull the water actually out of the reservoir onto our surface, and then we can evaporate the water. And moreover, and our surface can be uh, oriented in uh, any direction, directly facing the sunlight, which is not uh, possible for, for uh, all these existing uh, material technologies. So what I'm going to do here is uh, I'll just show a short video so we can see how this works. In much of the world, clean water for drinking or washing hands is readily available, but 30% of the global population lacks this access. In the past, Professor of Optics Chun-Li Guo's lab at the University of Rochester pioneered a super wicking and super absorbent black metal technology. Now, they are using this innovation to harness sunlight and purify water at an ultra high efficiency. By treating a piece of aluminum with a femtosecond laser, they created a black super wicking surface. When the treated metal surface makes contact with water, it wicks away a thin layer, even drawing it upward against gravity. Unlike solar absorbers that lie flat on or below the water's surface, this metal can be adjusted to match the angle of the sun, allowing it to absorb the maximum amount of sunlight. Yeah, so basically um, the, the key thing is um, uh, we were able to uh, demonstrate this, uh, um, um, you know, we can, uh, we can have the surface uh, really pull a very thin layer of water and then also always directly facing the sun and therefore we'll have a very high efficiency uh, indeed on the, um, this graph on the right and um, something I would not be able to get into this is um, also the super hydrophobic surface and uh, change the molecular bond, intermolecular bond of the water is actually uh, allow us to evaporate the water in the much larger clusters and far more efficiently. So compare, ended up our device have the efficiency uh, higher actually than ideal device operating at 100% efficiency by assuming uh, using the bulk water. So, uh, so afterwards, you know, we were able to demonstrate we can uh, uh, this. So uh, purify the water against all these different types of um, uh, contaminants, including heavy metals, you know, dyes and, and uh, uh, 
you know, um, detergents and also the human waste as well. Um, so also the surface is very easy to clean. So, all right, so let me just wrap up my talk. And uh, this is certainly um, the contribution from a large group of um, uh, students, postdocs, both undergrads, grad students. And, and this is the photo uh, of um, members of my laboratory at University of Rochester. As, as Rung Feng early on uh, mentioned, um, also in the past few years, I was able to uh, uh, help uh, to build up a, a, uh, a laboratory at Changchun Institute of Optics, Fine Mechanics and Physics. And, um, and um, this collaborative lab also produced, grow very fast, produced a lot of exciting results and, and some of the work I was able to uh, and mention this talk as well. And just lastly, um, at the 60th anniversary, we were able to, uh, uh, working with a CRC press, we are releasing this uh, a very large uh, volume handbook, handbook of laser technology and applications. And it's a four volume second edition. Um, so uh, I was uh, with my colleague, we added this handbook and hopefully we'll, we'll be able to uh, uh, reach the, reach the readers uh, later in the year. Uh, thank you very much for, for your attention. Well, Charlie, thank you very much for the wonderful talk. So you always impress me with your creativity and you know, the way you deliver the results to a uh, more wider um, audience. So we received many questions, uh, but in the interest of time, so we probably only can uh, uh, discuss two or three questions. Um, I think your functional surfaces are very impressive. There's one question from our audience is about mm -hmm. the uh, reliability of the uh, laser sheet surface. Can they last for long or, or how, how do you, you know, uh, expect, how do you design the uh, lifetime and the reliability for the surfaces? Sure, yeah. So. Um... So over the years, we, we have definitely looked into uh, uh, how to increase the durability of the, sur the surface structures. And we actually have uh, had a couple of works uh, also published recently in the last couple of years. Um, I, I didn't have time to mention those works, particularly addressing uh, the durability. Um, so in one of the demonstrations, we were able to demonstrate um, they can sustain um, some uh, abrasion, you know, the, some abuse of the surface structures, they um, we will be able to uh, make them um, um, increasingly more and more durable. Um, also, you can, uh, um, the other thing is you can uh, uh, having some protected layer develop. Um, for example, when I mentioned this uh, TEG research, thermal electric gen uh, generator research, and we use a tungsten surface, and then we have to heat it into uh, to a very high temperature, 400 C. And at 400 C, everything will be uh, ox will uh, the metal will, will get oxide. And what you can do is you can sort of uh, maybe having a protected layer in this very high temperature operation. So we actually uh, coated a, a small layer of TiO2 and which is uh, uh, protecting the oxidation of the metal surface. And, and therefore you can, uh, but without, you know, uh, sacrificing any absorption ability. So you can uh, both, uh, um, you know, trying to continuously improve the durability as well as some having some protective layers. Okay, thank you, Shen Lei. There's one more question. Uh, it's about uh, the water harvesting. Uh, so mm -hmm. one, of our uh, listeners like to know the yield of the water harvesting. I guess uh, how fast you can uh, collect water from the environment. Okay. Well, this this is really depends on the on the size of your sample, right? And uh, it, it's hard for me to say. Uh, for example, uh, in the laboratory, we use a very small piece of sample, um, and then demonstrate. Uh, a smaller quantity of water uh, purification. Obviously, you can scale this up 
when you use a much larger sample, you'll be able to pull more water out of the reservoir and evaporate. And overall, the, the yield will be high. The reason for that is um, um, the, the water uptake, the super weakened uh, effect is, is actually very strong. And we, we have been demonstrate um, this uptake water speed is about two, three centimeter per second. That's the, that's the speed. And therefore you can sort of, uh, uh, and once this water uh, come onto the surface and underneath the hot sun, essentially all, of, all, all the water will get evaporated. So um, we can uh, uh, basically try to, uh, um, basically you just need to have the surface become wider and, and larger, we will be able to, uh, uh, you know, pull more water and, and have them purify. Well, thank you, Chen Lei. Uh, probably the last one is from myself. So you have done a lot of great work in uh, laser material interactions, especially uh, in the fencing laser applications. So mm -hmm. as we know, the fencing lasers are very fast. Usually for the fundamental interactions, we say that uh, we can uh, achieve non-thermal uh, processing. So we can uh, like uh, drill holes, uh, cutting or uh, surface removal with the minimum surface, surface effects, but uh, mm -hmm. uh, thermal effects. And uh, at the same time, we see a lot of your structures are probably uh, a bit more based on some nanoscale thermal uh, uh, mm -hmm. contribution. So mm -hmm. uh, how do we uh, understand this uh, non-thermal and non-thermal uh, uh, contributions to the material processes? So how, when we can get a non-thermal processes and when we have to consider the thermal contribution? That's, a, that's kind of oh. a question I think. Uh, okay, yeah, yeah. Rungfeng, this, this is a very good question actually. It's, a, um, it's actually a very um, um, profound question I think for this community. And indeed, um, the pervading thought for femtosecond laser processing is uh, the pulse is short, just as you mentioned, and we can sort of cut off the non-thermal effects. Um, therefore, they were able to demonstrate all this uh, micro-machining precision um, uh, material processing. Uh, however, um, about, you know, um, about a decade ago, when, when I first look into this problem, Interesting enough, we were particularly looking to um, what is the, is there actually a, was there a thermal contribution for the laser processing, the, the precise question you asked. We actually found there's a significant amount of thermal uh, contribution, even for femtosecond laser processing. So we published a couple of works uh, early on, around 2005, 2006-ish, and looking at uh, thermal, residue thermal deposition after you uh, have the laser process. We developed a technique which will allow us to measure how much heat we'll be able to deposit uh, after the material processing. And then we saw it was quite, quite a lot. In fact, those study, early study, really allow us to uh, gain some, some insight about how, how we control the, you know, we can perhaps turn up the thermal effects, turn down the thermal effect. We can do different things, allow us to um, have a better control of the, the, uh, the femtosecond laser processing. So my answer is, I think it's a still a very complex problem. It does deserve further study in this community. And I, I don't think it has been studied uh, very extensively uh, in this community. I, I do like to see uh, more work here because before our study, everybody was based on, uh, there was actually no experimental evidence. Uh, it was based on the, the, the basically common sense. Uh, um, but um, so when we provide provided this experimental evidence, it was actually quite somewhat surprising, but uh, on the other hand, it really gave us a lot of insights. Yeah, so thanks Rungfeng for asking this question. Well, thank you, Chen Lei. Uh, I'm sure there are many more questions coming, but unfortunately, you know, we have to uh, follow time. Uh, I think the, the uh, listeners in, in, in China is getting late. late. Uh, 
Um, we just would like to thank uh, uh, Charlie again for the wonderful, impressive talk. Uh, and uh, so we like to, you know, uh, give you this uh, certificate electronically at this moment. And um, uh, to thank you for the contribution to this uh, webinar and certainly the contribution to the community and society. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, with this, I'd like to uh, give the time back to Alice and uh, probably she will do uh, some uh, closing remarks for this uh, event. Alice? Okay, thank you, Professor Yongfeng. Thank you, Professor uh, Guo, your wonderful talk. Actually, I enjoy it very much. We see all of these beautiful you know, results. We know the stories, how you made it. So, yeah, this was a certification for you. Yongfeng already gave you. We was you know, sent to you in, uh, when sometime we met in person. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so next week, this is the end of this week. We have such a wonderful week. Now we have, uh, you know, many, many people. It's uh, really a high numbers. It's 359, you know, thousand uh, audience online. So that's a really a large number. We're proud of that. It's really lighting the world. So next week we will have two, you know, super speakers on the stage too. Yeah, next week we will have Chen Gang from MIT. We'll have Zhenan uh, from uh, Zhenan Bao from Stanford University. Both of our well-known you know, uh, scientists and they will talk about stories in heat transfer and in the smart skin. So our guest host will be Zhe Gang Su from Harvard University and Paul Wicks from UCLA. So next week, 8 o'clock, we see you online. And uh, we also have one thing, you know, we'll start, you know, uh, yeah, in this summer, as August, it's for the students. I name it as a graduated school students, you know, academic league. So it will be, you know, in Chinese, but we invited the uh, graduate students to join us on this, you know, uh, kind of a uh, uh, Tech show so in the summer so if you interested please scan the code and you will see all this lively show for the students and uh, this was a, a conference yeah I was going to be chaired so be sure to save the date and uh, submit your uh, abstract and you support the conference online and uh, yeah that's a bunch of speakers waiting for you on ICAX talks so we keep on going we see you next week we see you you know in next few weeks for all uh, these wonderful talks. Okay, see you next week. Bye-bye.